Welcome to the second part of Lecture 12. Up until this point, in our consideration of viscoplastic materials, we've looked at shear flows. In other sections of this course, after shear flow, we've always examined the effect of extensional flow on a material. And so what we're going to do now is start that analysis for an idealised material. We're not going to look immediately at a viscoplastic material. We're going to look at a material that we're going to call perfectly plastic. Now, the definition of a perfectly plastic material is a material that will deform once a yield stress has been reached, but won't deform any faster or any quicker if that yield stress is exceeded. So all a perfect plastic material needs in able to deform is the yield stress. So we're going to see what happens to a cylinder of perfectly plastic material as we extend it uniaxially. And don't forget that uniaxial extension was a deformation we examined right back in lecture one. It's effectively stretching a material. Now, although this is a very idealised case, it leads to an important concept, which is the minimum amount of work required to deform a plastic material. And we will derive an expression for this. And this is going to be something that we're going to call homogeneous work. Now, all this has relevance to an industrial process termed extrusion. Extrusion is the shape forming process that is used for plastic pipes, for supermarket bags, for any variety of materials that have a constant cross section. You can extrude viscoplastic materials, viscoelastic materials. Sometimes you might even find materials that are approaching Newtonian ish, but rarely. Viscoelastic materials suffer from extra date swell because of stored stress. Viscoplastic materials have the very nice ability, usually, to maintain their shape post-extrusion. There are, of course, caveats to this, as there are processing instabilities for viscoplastic materials, much there as there are processing instabilities for viscoelastic materials. So, if you want a mental model for extrusion at this point, and extrusion of viscoplastic material in particular, think about toothpaste. You get your tube of toothpaste, you squeeze out a prismatic shape, a cylinder effectively. That is the action of extrusion. You are shape forming that toothpaste. Now toothpaste, as it happens, is a multiphase material. More about multiphase materials in section D of this course. But toothpaste has a yield stress. So when you squeeze out that toothpaste onto the windowsill, if you're having a bad morning, or onto your toothbrush, if you're having a good morning, then you will see that the shape on the windowsill or the toothbrush is largely unchanged after time. It might sag a bit to start with, and this is where self-weight exceeds yield stress. But after that sagging has stopped, the material doesn't flow. So, think toothpaste when we think extrusion, and let's think about the simplest possible case we can use, which is that of a perfectly plastic material. So, on the board in front of you, I have put a schematic diagram of a cylinder of diameter D0 and of length L0. This is my initial cylindrical state. I'm going to deform this cylinder uniaxially. I'm going to do that by applying a force in the axial direction equally. So I'm going to stretch this cylinder of material out. And as I do so, the diameter will decrease and the length will increase. And we know from lecture one that we can work out the relationship between the length increase and the diameter decrease by consideration of the strain rate tensor. This is a strain rate tensor for an extensional deformation. It only has terms on the principal diagonal. And we can use that knowledge along with continuity to figure out how D relates to L. So let's have a think. A perfectly plastic material only requires a yield stress to deform. So this force is a measure of the cross-sectional area of that cylinder multiplied by a quantity called sigma p, and this is the plastic bulk yield strength of the material. If we're thinking engineering terms, we need to figure out how much work is required to make that deformation happen. And the most common measure of work is volumetric work. Volumetric work is something that we simply know as pressure. So how does extrusion pressure relate to deformation of material? So let's develop an analysis. Force 
is stress times area. We've just seen that on the previous slide. So as we extend our cylinder, we're increasing its length by an amount dl. And so the force times that distance in the direction of the force, dl, gives us the small amount of work that's done, dw. So dw is the area times sigma p times dl. Now, area involves a measure of length. So let's substitute in that initial condition. We're going to say that volume is conserved throughout this process. This is an assumption and depending on the structure of the material may not be true. Have a look at the Poisson's ratio to decide whether it is or isn't true. If we assume that it is true, the area times the length at any point of deformation is constant. So the initial area A0 times the initial length L0 is the volume, which of course is simply the area times the length at any point in the deformation. So let's make L the subject of that little expression and substitute it into our work expression, which means that the work done, the integral of dw from 0 to big W, is simply a naught l naught sigma p times the integral of 1 over l dl with limits of l naught, the initial condition when there's no work done, through to l, the final length of that cylinder once all the work w has been done. So performing that integration, we get the result that w, the work required, is a naught l naught sigma p, plastic bulk yield strength, log l over l naught. And we're going to call L over L0 the extensional strain. And we're going to denote that by the symbol epsilon subscript L. So there is an expression for my work. Now, work necessarily isn't that particularly measurable in a flow. So let's think of work per unit volume or pressure. And so let's divide W by the volume of the material. The volume of the material is simply A0 L0. We know that at the initial condition. So my pressure required to drive this deformation, W over A0 L0, is going to be equal to sigma P, the A0 and the L0 cancel out very nicely, log L over L0. We can rewrite this in terms of diameter change rather than length change, if you wish. And remembering that volume is conserved and that cross-sectional area is pi D squared over 4, we can say that, well, L over L0 is going to be D0 squared over D squared. So simply dropping that into the log expression and then removing the power outside the log gives us that the pressure is 2 sigma P log D0 over D, which may be a slightly more convenient expression to use if you're shape forming a certain cross-sectional diameter from an original cross-section diameter. Now, Remember, this analysis is for a perfectly plastic material. The only stress required to drive this material to deform is the yield stress. But we can see that there is an amount of work required to change the shape of this material. That's the amount of work that we've just derived, that pressure. And this is something we call homogeneous work. This is the internal resistance to shape change for a perfectly plastic material. Now, when we have a look at viscoplastic materials, we'll see that actually the expression is a lot more complex because they have to do work against friction as they slip through an extruder. This does not include that. There is no external work done in this equation. Other than the internal resistance to shape change, there's no other internal work done either. So real materials will also have to overcome internal viscous forces. So this really is a very simple expression and in the next part of this lecture, we're going to develop or see how one would develop a more complex expression that has this external and internal work done against friction and viscous forces. So let's summarise. Our analysis for extensional flow to begin with has involved a perfectly plastic material. We've seen that perfectly plastic materials just need their yield stress to drive the deformation. We saw that even for simple material of this nature, there is a certain amount of work required to change shape. And we call this amount of work homogeneous work. And we wrote it in terms of a diameter change 
and the plastic bulk yield strength as 2 sigma p log d0 over d, where d0 is the original diameter and d is the final diameter. Real materials will also have additional work terms over and above homogeneous work, which is what we're going to explore next, and we will introduce something called redundant work.